the wall. There are seats in the balcony if you would like to uh, just go up the stairs just outside the hall and the balcony's right above right above you. Coordinator of the college guest lecture series. And in this role, I would like to welcome all of you to tonight's presentation. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have speakers addressing issues pertaining to preservation. And in our guest lecture series, we try to bring in speakers from all over the country who speak to the various uh, programs that we have in the college. And I would like to announce that next Monday evening at this time, we will have David Camp, who is founder of Dirt Works Incorporated. I love that name, Dirt Works. <clears throat> Uh, who is a landscape architect who will be speaking on the subject of therapeutic landscapes. Um, again, I would like to welcome all of you, and so that we can get to tonight's presentation, I would like to turn the podium over to Jim Glass. Thank you, Sonny. Um, we're I'm pleased uh, uh, to uh, welcome you on behalf of the uh, uh, Graduate Program in Historic Preservation, Master of Science Historic Preservation Program, to uh, this evening's guest lecture. Uh, we're all pleased to have you here at a special event, one of several being marked today in the College of Architecture and Planning. 20 years ago this fall, the faculty of the college, led by the late David Hermanson, launched a Master of Science in Historic Preservation degree here to provide professional training for those who wanted to work in the new historic preservation field. Over the past 20 years, some 85 people have completed their coursework and gone to work for nonprofit preservation organizations, government agencies, house museums, historic sites, and consulting firms. They help to provide the authoritative answers needed by old home restorers, Main Street merchants, nonprofit institutions, and commercial developers that make up the American preservation movement. Tonight, as part of the 20th anniversary celebration, we are hosting a 20th anniversary lecture, which is also part of the 99-2000 College Guest Lecture Series. As our 20th anniversary lectures, we are pleased and honored to have with us William A. and Gail T. Cook. Bill and Gail Cook of Bloomington have made the West Baden Springs Hotel a household word in Indiana. Over the past three years, in a unique partnership with Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana, the Cooks have rescued the dilapidated and endangered hotel, the eighth wonder of the world, and spent $34 million of their own money to restore most of the building and grounds to their pre-depression grandeur. The exacting standards for restoration followed by Bill and Gale and the comprehensive, comprehensiveness of their approach won them the highest recognition of the National, National Trust for Historic Preservation last year, the National Preservation Honor Award. However, the Cooks are not new to preservation. They've been practicing it for over 30 years, long before there was a widespread interest in preserving historic landmarks and communities in Indiana. As owners of the Cook Group Incorporated, a very large company headquartered in Bloomington, <laughs> the uh, Cooks have set an example for other Hoosier businesses by restoring endangered historic structures in their hometown and finding adaptive uses for them, often involving companies in the Cook Group. For example, they saved the former Illinois Central Freight Depot in Bloomington and converted it to retail space they renovated the Showers Plaza, a former factory building in downtown Bloomington, and adapted it to house offices for one of the Cook Group companies, for Indiana University administrative offices, and for Bloomington City Hall. On the south side of the courthouse square, the Cooks acquired a largely vacant block of retail buildings, rehabilitated them, and opened a retail mall to serve the Bloomington community. Bill and Gail have also come to the rescue of threatened landmarks outside Bloomington over the past decades. Near Gentryville, Indiana, they saved and restored the Colonel William Jones House one of the few buildings in Indiana associated with, surviving buildings uh, in Indiana associated with the boyhood of Abraham Lincoln, and presented it to the state of Indiana to become a state historic site. In Laconia, Indiana, they purchased, restored, and furnished Cedar Farm, a notable Greek revival plantation home. For all these reasons, it's a great personal pleasure to introduce to you Bill and Gail Cook to present this evening's lecture, West Baden Awakens. Will you help me welcome Bill and Gail Cook?
Thank you, Jim. Bill and I are delighted to be here, and especially delighted to be talking about our favorite subject, West Baden Springs. Uh, we have more or less divided our slides the way we divide our interest in a preservation project. I like the history, the research, the documentation, the art, the architecture. Bill likes the bricks, the mortar, and the construction challenges. So that's the way we will present the story. First of all, we will show you a few of those uh, buildings that Jim mentioned to show you the progression, because we didn't just start with a West Baden. We started with this modest house that became the Colonel William Jones uh, State Historic Site. It was falling down. We went to see it, and we felt so bad, we bought it and restored it. And then, uh, almost simultaneously in Bloomington, the uh, 1850 Cochrane House was threatened. That's the two-story part of this picture. And we needed an office at the time, so we restored it, and it is now the international headquarters of Cook Group Incorporated. A few blocks away was the depot that Jim mentioned, and after some work, it became a retail establishment. Then the vacant Graham Hotel, an eyesore on our city square, uh, had been that way for seven years. And we, the, well, the inside looked pretty bad, too. So we turned it into a very successful office building. And then for uh, our personal satisfaction, we got involved in the restoration of the Cedar Farm Plantation Complex on the Ohio River. And this is the way that looks today. And then on the south side of the square, uh, the, the whole row of buildings was threatened from lack of occupancy and uh, being unsound. The buildings facing the street could be saved, but in back were tacked on buildings with no foundations toward the alley. So those were removed, the storefronts were kept, a small atrium in back ties them all together, and there now are about 17 storefronts that are uh, once again in use facing the square. Then the Showers Building, which is 200,000 square feet, in partnership with the city of Bloomington, Indiana University, uh, we began a restoration of this building, which is now the city hall and commercial space. Inserted here, chronologically, would come West Baden Springs. You may have noticed a pattern. Each project is getting bigger. So I thought you would like to see what followed West Baden Springs. And that's the general store in Laconia, Indiana. There was no store in a 40-mile cir circle, no place to buy bread, milk, or gasoline. It closed because of the moratorium on um, old underground gasoline tanks. And that's where Cedar Farm is. So we couldn't buy bread and milk and gasoline. So we got involved in restoring this, and just three weeks ago, Judy O'Bannon came to Little Laconia and cut the ribbon, and we had a big celebration. Well, those are some of the uh, 45 or 50 buildings that we've renovated. Many on the National Register are in National Register districts, but there's only one National Historic Landmark, and that's West Baden Springs one of only 26 in Indiana. This is a fantasy picture. It never looked like this. It never had eight towers, and it never had an onion dome on top of the big dome. But the real thing was just as fantastic. There are some features here that you may notice because they're going to disappear as the years go by. The four towers will disappear. The scallop parapet around the top of the wall will go and the elaborate gardens will cease to be. And this is what most of us saw during the 70s and early 80s. You can see there are no towers anymore, no scallop parapet, no flowers in the garden. 
And those intervening years can be uh, accounted for very easily by watching what happens to the arch that's out on the highway in West Baden. This is the main entrance. When the hotel was built, they capitalized on the names of two of the most well-known spas in the world by calling it West Baden Springs, the Carlsbad of America. And in the center on the medallion is the little elf Sprudel who promotes the drinking of Sprudel water. And then, after, it was built in 1902, closed in the Depression in 32, and became a Jesuit seminary called West Baden College. Sprudel has been replaced by the coat of arms of St. Robert Bellarmine, the patron saint of West Baden College. They were there for 30 years, from 1934 to 64. And then the building became Northwood Institute, another college. Now there's a big inn in the medallion. They closed in 1983, and the building was empty for 13 years. And this is what we found when we took our first document, uh, documentation pictures in May of 1996. This was such a sad reminder to everyone who lived there because it was on the highway, the hotel is back from the road, and every time people passed it, they saw it in this condition. So it was the first thing we worked on, and late in the summer, we rewired it. We had a lighting ceremony and an ice cream social. And Sprudel is back in the medallion. The lights are on. And the local people even celebrated by building this float for the fall pumpkin parade. That's more or less a facsimile. The building was designed by Harrison Albright, an architect who trained at Spring Garden Institute in Philadelphia. He was 35 years old when he designed the building. He became known later for his work in California. He designed the U.S. Grant Hotel in San Diego, the Balboa Park Organ Pavilion in San Diego, this bank building in Coronado, the library in Coronado, he wrote an article called Reinforced Concrete Construction and Why I Favor It. That's what he was known for in California. You will see the irony in this title when Bill shows his slides of the concrete at West Baden. The builder of the hotel was Lee Sinclair. He had owned the old hotel that burned in 1901 and he worked with Albright to build the new domed hotel. Uh, in the picture in the background, you s this is taken in the big atrium at West Baden. This is the seal fountain when it was indoors. There's the seal. And this is his collie, Rex. And we have Rex tombstone now in the museum in uh, West Baden, in the Historic Landmarks Museum. Uh, he died in 1916, which, in fact, was the same year that Lee Sinclair died. In this picture, Lee Sinclair is on the right, then his daughter Lillian, then his wife, and then on the left is Charles Rexford and the seal fountain and Rex. Uh, when um, Lee Sinclair died, Lillian and her husband Charles Rexford were running the hotel. And Charles Rexford was known as a big spender and somewhat of a dandy, and he very quickly went through his wife's inheritance and some borrowed money. And the hotel was in financial trouble. He's the one who put in the marble and the light fixture and the mosaic and the uh, gardens and all these trimmings that we've been restoring. So the hotel was rather desperate for money. And in 1918, well, oh, wrong gadget. In 1918, the US Army took over the hotel and had a hospital for returning veterans from 1918 to 19. Lillian Sinclair 
fell in love with a soldier, divorced Charles Rexford, moved to California, and sold the hotel to Charles Ballard. He was the one who owned it uh, during the 20s and in 1932 when it closed in the Depression and gave it to the Jesuits. So those various owners that I mentioned passed through, and then this is what we found at the entrance in 1996. We did literally have to cut away the undergrowth to get to parts of the hotel. This is an entrance. Inside, the big atrium looked like this. Uh, you can see the uh, peeling walls the dark and soiled ceiling, and everything falling apart, not to speak of the other parts of the hotel outside of the dome. And now it looks like this, in case you haven't seen it. Uh, the designs on the floor are carpets. They did, in fact, have runners over the floor uh, sometime in the past. We had these uh, custom made, and the design um, mimics the flame design that is on the ceiling, painted on canvas up above. And then part of the mosaic shows. Uh, this is the way it looked uh, last month when we had a banquet there. Uh, 2,000 people can easily be seated in the dome and even more. Here's a view of the mosaic that remains. This is marble mosaic in the atrium. Uh, the rest of the floor, as Bill will explain, had to be uh, covered with another material because the mosaic had been removed years ago. This is a view of the atrium during its first 17 years before Lillian and Charles Rexford's remodeling. And in this picture. You see still the seal fountain in the middle, and the columns are not covered. They are just brick. And this is shown in uh, this column. Uh, after we were working on it, you can see uh, the construction. It was later then covered with canvas, and here's a picture of it with the columns now covered after the 1917 renovation and redecorating, and the uh, hand-painted murals that were on the wall. Uh, this shows a strip where the murals would have been vertical against the columns, and even a piece of the uh, canvas hanging at the bottom. It's from uh, pieces like that that Conrad Schmidt, the art restorer from Milwaukee, was able to uh, redesign the murals on the wall. This, in fact, is a strip of heavy canvas that had an original hand-painted garland on it with a big jewel in the middle. There's the jewel. And then it had been painted over with this salmon-colored paint. So using this, we were able to determine the colors and the design that was on the wall. And here is one of the first samples that we got. And this is uh, an example of the human figures that are up on the sixth floor against the wall, which we also had hand painted. And this is the studio of Conrad Schmidt near Milwaukee, where they are painting those vertical canvases here, and they're hand painting other designs here. Uh, here's a, a remnant of painting along the wall. You can see a sort of a green leaf design there, and then here is the reproduction of that on canvas as Conrad Schmidt worked their way around the walls, uh, duplicating what they found. And in this slide, <clears throat> you can see uh, they have done a sample all the way up to the ceiling, and this little clean spot is the first attempt at restoring the ceiling canvases. While the other murals had disappeared, the canvases on the ceiling were still there. They're hand-painted also. And those canvases are stretched on wood stretchers, very much like an oil painting, and then affixed to the ceiling. 
So what Conrad Schmidt did where possible was paint in the background again with clean colors and touch up the original paintings. And now you can see half and half. On the left, they have the, the garland against the column, and on the right, no work has been done. The top of a column. Uh, this is one of the four statues, and in the background you can see the condition of the columns. These statues are about 10 feet high. There are four of them of the muses. They had never moved. They had been there ever since the Pompeian court redecorating of 1917. So we did not move them, but we did cover them with boxes while we were working overhead to protect them. Also in the big atrium is this fireplace made of uh, ceramic tile, which we think is rookwood, although we have never found written documentation. This is a close-up of the tile showing the little elf Sprudel again, drinking Sprudel water from the ram's horn, which after all is the reason that the, Spr the West Baden Springs Hotel was there, is because they had this sulfur water, and then later gambling too. Uh, this is the lobby, as it used to be when it was a lobby. It is also a dome, by the way. It's a small dome, 92 feet in diameter, and the big atrium is 200 feet in diameter. When the Jesuits came, they turned the lobby into a sanctuary, and then when Northwood Institute was there, they turned it into a theater. When we found it 13 years later, it looked like this. And you can see uh, these supports, which are holding up the ceilings. Holes in the ceiling, the water came pouring through. And then in these eight fan lights, there are no windows because all of them were stained glass and had been stolen some months before we began work. Uh, this shows the first work being done to restore those windows in the lobby. You see the stained glass that remains in the bottom, but nothing in the top. And what we did was uh, put these sash bars in fan-like arrangement in the windows to simulate uh, the old windows. And then one day, one of the guides who works at West Baden was in an antique store in Louisville and found four of the original windows that had been stolen about two years before. So we were able to get them back, and then a generous donor uh, paid for having four replicas made by Sunburst Stained Glass Company in Newburgh, Indiana. We removed all of the religious symbols left by the Jesuits because we thought if we didn't do it, the next owner would. But these angels are almost secular now. You see angels everywhere. So we've left the angels, and we'll see what happens. So now the windows look like this again. This is the uh, entrance to the lobby. This is one of the columns in the lobby that has some low relief work, the gray and white at the top. And then this is one of the columns restored by Conrad Schmidt. And this is the trompe l'oeil technique. There is no relief there, but you almost have to touch it to make sure because it is flat painted. And the lobby today looks like this. You see the uh, mosaic floor in this room, which is ceramic tile mosaic, and the one in the atrium is marble. The dining room looked like this. The kitchen looked like this. The dining room has now been made to look a little better, and the ceilings have uh, the old designs restored as uh, much as we could tell from the old photographs. Then on the sixth floor, remnants of the spas remained. Uh, there were steam baths, there were tubs for mud baths. You did all kinds of things with these waters in the past. But on the sixth floor, we have done something else. We have built a conference suite or an executive suite as an example of what could be done with the hotel rooms because the guest rooms are all gutted. We only did the public areas. We have done nothing with the guest rooms. But we did this so that anyone looking at the hotel could see what it looks like as a luxury building 
inside with all new surfaces. This is not a restoration of anything. We aren't doing the guest rooms because we don't know whether people want offices, small rooms, suites, or what, but this is an example of the quality that can be achieved within the shell that is given. When the hotel was built, fortunately, photos were taken, and you can see in this picture how it's built. There's a ring of rooms outside the hotel, then there's a hallway, then there's a ring of rooms facing the atrium. You can also see the columns being built here that are going to support the dome. There are 24 columns. And then you see the first placement of the ribs that are tied together with a hub. There's a scaffold up the center of the dome holding up the hub, and on top of that, a derrick and a boom for raising each of the steel ribs on top of the columns. This is an interior picture showing that scaffolding that is holding up the center. And a good look at the hub itself, and follow this along because we're going to get to the inside of the hub eventually. And then the atrium with the ribs in place and the hub unsupported after the architect, Harrison Albright, stood on top while they removed the center scaffolding. <laughs> and here again is the hub, which now has the famous chandelier uh, underneath it. And you can see a good view here of how each of these ru um, ribs comes together at the hub. In order to get there, you have to go up to the flat roof, then climb a ladder outside the dome until you're in this cupola. Then you go through a trap door, and then you will be in the hub. This is the ladder that you climb over the roof. A look again at uh, the cupola and the hub beneath it. And inside the hub, are the famous but seldom seen angels of West Baden. There are 11 larger than life size hand painted angels inside this hub. We don't know who painted them and probably never will. They were not painted by the Jesuits because the graffiti on top of the paintings predates the Jesuits. So this is a mystery. Uh, they are copies, by the way, of a Fra Angelica altarpiece done in about the 15th century. Also on the hub, we found remnants of the carillon that was there. Uh, these are wooden discs or platters, and there were 206 bells attached to the ceiling. Here's one big bell. Then this is a platter with two bells. Here's one with three bells. Here's one with three bells. And then this has many smaller bells. And this holds uh, small chimes. This was installed in about 1913 and was used for entertainment, giving concerts. Knowing the acoustics of that dome, I cannot imagine what 200 bells being played would sound like. After the Jesuits came, they kept the carillon, but it was used to call the monks to prayer. And they gave one concert a year at Christmas. Uh, this shows our electrician who has one of these platters with three bells on it. There's a bell uh, on exhibit here also. And he was able to uh, put power to it and make them ring again. But there are so few remaining, uh, there was no hope to restoring it. Also on top of the dome, 110 feet up, each night after we put fresh paint on the steel, the next morning there were raccoon tracks in the paint. <laughs> so on top of the dome, we had to institute raccoon control. This is a view of the garden looking through uh, a fallen arch toward the uh, Apollo Springhouse the way it looked later. 
walking to Apollo through the weeds in May of 96, the vines on the Apollo temple, uh, the bowling alley after we had cleared off the vines that covered it like kudzu from top to bottom. This was the shooting gallery attached to the bowling alley and the way it looks now with tile roof restored also. Uh, this is a look at the garden uh, before we did any work, but after we mowed the lawn. In the center was this brick pedestal, which was left over from Jesuit days. It had a religious statue on it. We knew from old photos there was a fountain in the center. So that has now been restored along with the flower beds according to the designs that were in old photographs also. I should say, we're say I'm saying we all the time, but really Historic Landmarks Foundation and the local people and we were all in this together uh, and we got a lot of information and help from everyone else. Here's a look at the gardens and of the one building that is no longer there and that's the Sprudel Pavilion, which was a very large spring house with sculpture, glazed brick, stained glass. It unfortunately was leveled and pushed underground and during our work in the garden, we found where it is. It was more or less bulldozed into the pit where the spring was. And so these remnants of the glazed brick and the sculptured pieces are all underground for future archeologists. There was a Catholic church on the ground so that the guests of the hotel did not have far to go. Uh, notice the uh, round stained glass window above the entrance. It's still in existence today, a few miles away at the Catholic Church in Dubois, Indiana, along with some of the other windows. On the foundations of the old church, the Jesuits placed the statue of St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits. Now here's the seal fountain again. It was inside in the pictures of uh, the Sinclair family, and now it is outside after uh, Charles and Lillian's renovation. It was moved from the big atrium to the outside. The seal is still there. This picture was taken in 1925, and the young couple standing in front are actually my parents. <laughs> the seal fountain looked like this after we mowed the grass. You can see the outline there. And then when we took the bushes out, we found the walls had fallen down. So we built a new foundation, put the walls back, and now it looks like this. The seal is long gone. We don't know where it is. Uh, one last word about domes. You often hear that when West Baden was built, it had the largest dome in the world with a 200 foot diameter. That may be true. Uh, you also hear that it was the largest dome in the world until the Houston Astor Dome was built, and we do not think that is true. The daughter of the architect of the Houston Astor Dome, who was Gustel Kiewit, says that he had built a lot of big domes before the Houston Astor Dome, including the St. Louis Arena in 1934. So that statement we no longer make. This is the Pantheon in Rome, built in 128 AD. It's only 145 feet in diameter. St. Peter's is 135 feet in diameter. But the next dome is larger. I wonder if anyone here has seen this. This is in the town of Yamasukro in the Ivory Coast in Africa was finished in 1990. It's 297 feet in diameter. It seats 7,000 people, or 12,000 or more if standing. And when my friends went there to get these pictures for me, there were 100 people there on Sunday morning. It was deliberately built 
by the president of Ivory Coast to outdo St. Peter's and be a fat St. Peter's. Uh, it's called uh, the Basilica of Our Lady of Peace. Uh, one last look uh, shows the hotel now with towers, which Bill will show you more about. The next slide will give you pause when we imagine a new owner, in particular a casino. This is a, <laughs> this is a rendering as done by a casino company when they thought that they might turn it into a casino. Over on the right is actually a riverboat. And how they floated that to West Baden, we don't know. And there's a nice riverway or waterway of some sort there reflecting the bright lights. The inside of our restored Pompeian court, they envisioned like this. But I have a lot of faith in the Historic Landmarks Foundation. <laughs> They will have covenants on the deed for a new owner and make sure that it remains very tasteful. This is my last slide. If any of you have not seen West Baden Springs, the wonderful historic landmarks, volunteer guides are there. Winter hours, Wednesday through Sunday, they give tours at 11, 1, and 2. Go take a look. Thank you. Why don't we all stand up just a few moments and take a break? These seats are harder than hell. I'm going to stand in. Can I sit? You can sit. You may want to raise this. Yeah, OK. I'd like to get it off if I could. Just, just snap out. Does it snap out? Yeah. Oh, good deal. Thank you. Right slide or left slide? Right slide. Before I get started, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, one person. Uh, Jim Heckman, would you come up uh, just a moment up to the center where people can see you? I'd like to just say a little bit about Jim. Jim has worked for our company for many, many years. He is a Ball State graduate. And Jim also uh, is a vice president of our marketing communications. He uh, and his associates in the uh, department have spent many, many, many hours at West Baden uh, photographing uh, the hotel. Now, that leads into the part of my story that, thanks, Jim, leads into the part of my story that <clears throat> I'm very concerned. If I don't make the point now, I won't make it. The point is that when you do a restoration, before anything can ever take place, including drawings or anything else, you must take pictures. You must take thousands of pictures. Every restoration that we did, we took pictures. Because in most instances, you will have no plans. And it's sort of a ready, fire, aim type of situation where you draw your plans after you're all done. Uh, if you attempt any other method, you may be in for a rather horrible surprise, and uh, we got surprised uh, very horribly. Now, Gail, uh, we call this the agony and the ecstasy uh, speech. 
she does the ecstasy and I do the agony. And so here we go. <clears throat> this is the way that we found the concrete on the, uh, on the arch. It wasn't too much, uh, except that you can see uh, the damage that has been done over time. And also, I think uh, we can say that the concrete wasn't the best. And I'll get into that concrete situation a little bit later. Uh, this is the arch being built, and as you can see, uh, the iron men up there uh, doing a pretty good job of getting the thing laid in. This is after we sandblasted that iron. And uh, to you students, uh, read up real good on your, uh, uh, the use and how to treat iron, because if you do not get the material down to the base material, to uh, re uh, resurface it, like painting, you're not going to have a job that will stand up. Now, it is perfectly okay to uh, sandblast iron, and uh, it describes very well in the uh, documentation and in uh, engineering journals on how to do it, and it is a relatively simple job if you do it properly. And we did do a fair amount of sandblasting on that to get the old lead paint off. And there it is again, and here it is as Gail showed it as well. Now this gets to the root of the story. Very few people realize, as Tina Connor says, uh, the building was standing up by habit. I can tell you now, I would not have told anyone this several years ago, that the building was a disaster. It was ready to fall down on somebody's ears, and the reason basically rests with this floor. The evidence is in the floor. As you can see during the uh, Northwood days, the concrete was uh, put in, and I believe that is a 1974? Uh, Jesuit. Jesuit days, okay. And they're uh, about ready to launch a balloon. There goes, uh, there goes the balloon, and you can see the outline of the, of the concrete and the mosaic. George Ridgway, who was the architect on this project, estimates that that uh, concrete floor raised, before Mr. McDonald uh, got at it, raised one and a half feet for some unknown reason. Now, the reason was given by some pretty knowledgeable people that perhaps the flowers being watered, the water ran down into the, uh, uh, somehow got underground and uh, created a hydraulic pressure. Uh, there were some other rather uh, unusual uh, excuses for the floor raising that I won't get into. But suffice it to say, one of the reasons that we took the building and started painting up the outside of the arch and painting the uh, uh, porch was we had to have time to think out what was, what was wrong. What was the problem with this building? The problem was, when we finally got up the guts to excavate, a layer, if I can find the gadget here. You see this layer right here, over here? Over here on the back side where it's not showing, that layer is very irregular, just as if it were uh, something had filled in a crevice or a pit or a part of something. We estimate that that was the old building, that these are the ashes of the old building that crystallized, and whatever dummy left it there created a problem that could have destroyed the building. This building could have gone down as a result of this because it was also two feet within the surface of uh, the part of the building that fell. I think that this solved the mystery. Uh, it was a, cost a great deal of money to get that pit in there, but if we hadn't done it, I uh, would have to say that I had probably chickened out on this project, gone home with my uh, uh, tail between my legs and just said, folks, let her fall down because we can't save it. 
You can see off to the right where I pointed there that there is an indentation on that material. You also can see it again off to the right, and it looks like it is built in some type of a pit. And uh, that crystallization <clears throat> is probably from the wood charcoal, and it crystallized, and there could very well have been some sulfur in there. I don't know exactly what the uh, components were that made it crystallize, but it looked very similar to cotton candy. In fact, somebody even said that it uh, looked like cotton candy. Uh, but they never ventured any reason why it looked like cotton candy, and it was crystal. This is a part of the mosaic floor that was going through repair. And this is, picture was taken sometime in the early, early on to uh, show the building at night uh, with the disc lighting the ceiling. I have seen other pictures of this, and it does look considerably more bright than this picture shows. You also can see the lamps that are down below. Gail, do we know what date that was approximately? We don't know, do we? This is the way we found the disc and the pendant hanging below. Uh, the polyethylene up there is for the aircraft flights. Uh, they had uh, airplanes that they flew in the dome, and they developed a considerable number of world records, but uh, they had a man that climbed up on this, uh, had a way of climbing up and uh, putting this polyethylene on the pendant. This is a picture of the disc and the pendant because it posed a, quite a mystery to, to us. Many of you that have heard the history of the West Baden Hotel have been told that this uh, huge disc and uh, the pendant uh, was lowered. And people were sitting on these chairs uh, up at the top. And as it was being lowered, the band played. But we never found anybody, we never found anyone at all that had ever seen this, except it was all hearsay. Uh, you can see that it is 18 or 16 feet in diameter, and it's 10 feet high. Uh, there is, was 720 pieces of glass that made up the reflecting part of those chairs. And they're par parabolas, of course, because you're uh, reflecting the light as if you were, uh, w with a floodlight, reflecting it to the ceiling. Then there were three lights down below that say floodlights uh, that lit the top of the disc. Boy, this was going to be fun for me. I was looking forward to doing something with this. This is the pendant being lowered. Would anybody want to venture a guess at what the material is that that's made of? It's plaster of Paris. It's very light. And somehow, some way, that, uh, that pendant remained intact beautifully. Another mystery on that pendant was found in the hub. Gail mentioned the religious figures uh, in the hub. Well, laying uh, beside that, uh, those pictures, was a group of partial disks, round-looking things. We could not figure out what these round, uh, partial round things were until the electrician and the lawyer who was up there with him surmised that these could be put into a circle and that that circle had a group of color, colored wheels. And uh, those colored wheels are right here. And you can see right here is the center. There was a motor mechanism on the back side of this that rotated this around. And this here represents 24 pieces of glass that were up there. Down below, whoops, there went my light. There we go. There we go. Down below is a, a, a layout of the, uh, uh, of the drawing, and we replicated it almost exactly. We were able to replicate it in paper almost exactly the way it was up there. 
But suffice it to say that projected light down on the seal fountain and it changed color as that wheel rotated around in the center, it changed color. That's why we know that the disc, the beautiful part of the disc and the hub was added later. When the seal fountain was removed, the disc, uh, the plaster press part of the disc was probably put up as was the pendant although the plaster of Paris disc may have been there before. These are the chairs with the glass removed. We replaced that glass <clears throat> using poetic license with polished stainless steel, much more durable. And this is the way the disc looks from the bottom. And that's the way it looks at night. And uh, for those of you that have been to the HLFI dinner, I think your vouch for the colored light coming down through the disc is pretty, uh, pretty spectacular. It's magnificent. I won't go into any more of the details of that uh, uh, disc except to say that it was a lot of fun doing the thing electronically. And it's, it is an electronic uh, uh, actuated disc now with uh, uh, different types of fluorescent and bulbs that cost, uh, cost us to operate about $75 an hour so we don't keep it on too long. Uh, there is a picture of the hub uh, and the mechanism of that rotating disc that I was talking to you about. We were able to put those together and then figure out how that actually worked. Now we get into the serious part of the story. I'm only using this picture just to illustrate that in 1991, the wall fell in. And there is the wall. Two feet underneath of that was that charcoal. And uh, we estimate that probably two things happened. Number one, the crystal and structure ballooned up, creating an unstable foundation. And number two, there are only a couple of bricks holding the concrete. It's sitting there pretty much by habit and it was from the very beginning. That, that part is really scary. By the way, I can't get this thing off now. There it goes. The concrete was in pretty sad shape, as you can see here. And uh, when we started looking at the building, there was only, it would only hold 10 pounds per square. So uh, we had to make it 125 pounds per square inch. That's another picture with a bathtub. And here's something that happened to George Ridgway. One night he went home. He had a group of students uh, with him that day. And they had walked in under the foundation. The next morning when he came back, that foundation was no longer there and the floor had caved in. Uh, at the same place as we showed that picture a moment ago where the, uh, the cave-in was, which was telling me that the building was beginning to fall apart. In other words, we were, the building was in jeopardy at that point. This is what HLFI did. Those wonderful people put these beams in and spent a lot of their own money before we ever got the, uh, the chance to restore the building. And wherever the building looked like it was standing up only by habit, uh, they put beams in and reinforced it. You can see there uh, the different types of, <laughs> what I want to call it, the different forms of concrete that are no longer there. And this is what we did. The entire building, is reinforced with three million pounds of, uh, with steel. Uh, I think that Ridgeway and Greg Blum, who also was the engineer, who was the engineer on the project, did a magnificent desi uh, design on this uh, structure in order to keep the building together. That's the outer parts of the room, and that's on the hall, and then of course the inner rooms are also reinforced. And this is now a building that should stand for three, 300 years or 200 years or whatever. I won't be around to see it. This is the first floor. And what we did is just to put in a temporary uh, ceiling. It, may, it could be permanent. And uh, uh, 
Denise, one of the nice painters, uh, did the stencil up there. And it makes the uh, hall look presentable. This is the steel. And if you will look over on the far right, you will see how the real men in the good old days used to put up things. They got up on, they got up on the uh, uh, top of the building and started building that ironwork that is the tower. The tower is not covered yet, but I don't think I'd want to be the guy up there doing that. As far as we can tell, uh, the parts of that, we found a part of it about a half mile away, and uh, that is an iron, that is an iron uh, construction. This is the mechanism that uh, everyone talks about that takes up the slack in the building when there is pressure such as snow on the roof. Uh, I don't know how the building ever stood up. When we took off the layers and layers of asphalt uh, uh, tile, there were 475,000 pounds of tar, paper, and shingles on that roof. 475,000 pounds. We replaced that with 65,000 pounds. It's a wonder the roof and this mechanism didn't give in. But this here is like a foot. It moves back and forth, and this here is a ways. As the building expands and contracts, as, the, as it's loaded either by heat or snow, uh, it moves back and forth. I have never seen it, nor have I measured it. I'm just being, I'm told that that will happen. What was the name of this? No, Construction Digest. Construction Digest uh, featured uh, our way of doing scaffolding. We found out that it would cost almost $2 million to scaffold a building. That means uh, either buying it or renting it, leasing it, whatever, if we scaffold the entire atrium. We wanted a cheaper way of doing it and unbeknownst to uh, ourselves, when we did it, we made rolling scaffolding. We made a, a scaffold that was just wide enough to go in between each one of those arches. And then we found out that it was sort of an old lost art form that scaffolders had done this for in previous years. But we were quite proud of it. And you can see the scaffolding, how beautiful it looks. And there were four four of these side by side, and we would move them counterclockwise uh, after each part of the building was complete. And, it, and they actually made two complete rounds in the atrium. And you can see the huge uh, rollers down below. Those rollers had to take a tremendous amount of pressure, and they did. They stood up very, very well for us. And we were able to move that with a very small tractor. It was just a little bit bigger than a garden tractor. <coughs> we also built scaffolding at the top to clean and work on the ceiling. And you can see that scaffolding up there. I'm sorry, uh, platform. And that's Gail standing on the platform looking down 120 feet. And that's... Uh, what, was, what replaced the scaffolding when we finished with the scaffolding. This is still a part of the building because we have to get to certain parts of the uh, atrium, and this uh, hoist is what we kept so that we can do that, cleaning the building. We just recently comp completed cleaning the building again but because of the residue dirt that uh, was from construction. We'll probably have to clean it every two or three years until it's sold. You can see the people up there working. Conrad Schmidt also uses it, used it to put in the finishing touches. This gets to the scaffolding on the outside that was not roller type, <clears throat> but it uh, could do one eighth of the building at a time. And uh, we used this atrium scaffolding and this scaffolding uh, together, so we were able to save an immense amount of money. We found out things uh, for the students of architecture 
that you always scrape um, mortar. Never try to saw it. Uh, never try to uh, uh, put any kind of jackhammer on it. Just scrape off the loose stuff and replaster it and then paint it. It'll stand up forever. And this is the monastic part of the building. Rather unloved looking. Not very happy. Uh, there's no parapets. There's nothing to make it stand out. But we're going to try to fix that. And this is a particular thing that we're quite proud of. How to make an elevator disappear. I doubt a very few people know that there's a modern elevator in there and we just painted it. We took a little poetic license and just made sure that it disappeared up there in the roof somewhere. So you can have a lot of things in restoration without uh, interfering with the beauty of the architecture. The other thing I might point out is the parapets. The parapets were removed for a reason. I don't think the Jesuits took, took them down just because of their, their belief that it was too worldly. I think they took them down because the water was getting down in between them and tearing the wall apart. And you could see up uh, when those parapets were removed and when we removed the tile, the 55 uh, pound uh, tile from the building that the monks, monks put up there, great, great damage had been done by water. And we suspect that was during the time of the parapets. So we did not make any kind of attempt to replace them as they were before because the same thing would happen again. That parapet would be at that parapet would be destroyed by water once again. So we made it out of stove uh, on the plywood, and we think that it, it enhanced the building. This is not always the way that uh, restorationists would like to do things, but there are some times that you must, must, must protect the building. And that comes even beyond trying to do faithful restoration. Protect the building first at all costs. This is the floor after the 465,000 pounds were removed. They're repairing it. <coughs> those, uh, uh, canvas, uh, those canvas frames have been removed from the top while they're doing this. And uh, they're, they're putting the wood on, and then that'll be followed by shingle. The floor, uh, uh, the ceiling, I'll get it right in a minute, the roof has tile, and then it has glass those beautiful skylights, and it, all, it also has uh, what we put on there, which was the, the, uh, the re regular roofing material. We tried to make it blend as well as we could, and that's just a conventional roof that is orange. It doesn't show orange there, but it is. This was some of the damage that was done by water that we had to repair. And it also shows what the windows looked like at the top before we began the restoration. And these people did not get overtime or hazardous pay, but they are actually out on the glass doing their thing, which is caulking, caulking, caulking. We also found that when we replaced the glass, the first glass that we put in uh, cracked. And guess why it cracked? It expanded and contracted just like all good things should. And uh, so we had to give it a little more room on the next panes. And I think we got it right. We hadn't seen any cracking. But the caulking will be an annual event for us. There's the parapets from the back. And you can see how we produced them to protect uh, the wall from any further incursion by water. The bottom of there is the original old asphalt uh, uh, it, asphalt uh, that was put on the rooms. Now we're off the dome. We're not on the dome now. And that's the way the orange tile, I'm sorry, the orange, uh, it compares with the tile. You can see, I think, with the roofing material, we did a pretty good job of matching. This brings the next subject. All buildings should have something beautiful. To, uh, if it was there once, you've got to bring it back. Uh, for costing purposes, those, uh, those cost us over a million dollars to put back. But there was no way I was going to leave the building without those towers. 
And so George Ridgway took his magnifier out on pictures and scaled it, and we came up with almost a perfect replica, except the interior, instead of being iron, is aluminum, much of it. Some of it is steel. The exterior of it is all aluminum. The original was tin, and it was painted. And we have that sort of hidden about a half mile away. I know where it is, and I can get it. But I've never picked it up yet. It's one of those things I need to do. And this is this was all done at <clears throat> Campbellsburg, Kentucky. Campbellsville, Kentucky. And they had to come in uh, eight pieces. And the reason was that it was too heavy to lift. Now, we're not going to lift these with scaffolding like the, uh, the other fellows, or build it like the uh, other fellows did. Uh, it's too dangerous. So we decided to have them prefabbed on the ground, and they were transported by Little Boy up to the, uh, and reassembled on the grounds. There they are uh, from the air. And you can see uh, what we're going to do in just a little bit. You can see the chopper over there to the right. The chopper, by the way, is called Bubba. And uh, Bubba lifts a lot of things. What Bubba is lifting at this point is 18,000 pounds. And uh, Bubba was not allowed to lift anymore. Uh, the top part of it was 3,500 pounds. So if Bubba couldn't lift 18,000 and 3,500 uh, 3, pounds, we had to split the uh, load, didn't we? So that's why there were eight lifts. It cost Bubba $25,000 to travel to West Baden. Uh, the folks that came to West Baden and Bubba did not come for a vacation, but they came to lift these things. And they began their work on the ground, and there's Bubba up there again doing his thing. But here he is on the ground. There's another picture of Bubba. And there is, gives you some idea of the size of that thing. It's a 1972 Sikorsky. It was built to, for military use to lift 25,000 pounds. But because the rotors are getting older, it's limited now to 18. There is, by the way, a 600 pound download uh, on that thing uh, just by the rotors moving. That's one of the reasons that you see the towers down so far is to take take some of that um, 600 pounds off of the structure. These are the workmen up there, and this was probably the most dangerous part of the entire building while we did the building, was what these men were going to do today, or that day, as far as getting the towers in place. These men are going to be grabbing ropes, uh, I'm sorry, cables, not ropes, cables that are suspended underneath to secure and hold and help bring down the, um, the load. And here it comes. You can see the little pointy head sticking out. No hazard pay. Down it comes, and uh, you can't see the ropes in that picture, but they're there. Still coming down. And here comes the next one over, and we're peaking the last tower. We're putting the last tower on with the, uh, the dome. Here comes Bubba again. See how far down that uh, uh, is? It's a long, long ways down to take off that 600 pounds of pressure. You can see it's very, very windy. And that, thing's, uh, that helicopter's sitting up way, way up there. Again, we can't see. I can see them on smaller slides, but I can't see the ropes there. But they are grabbing them. You can see the ropes now, just a little bit. They're steering it down, and that's the way it's looked when it's finished. It's all aluminum, and uh, it's uh, been painted, and Amidot, it's been painted, and uh, that paint should last a very, very long time. This is the back side of the powerhouse. That's the way it looks after restoration. This is the inside with the old boiler, and that old boiler is still there. We didn't want to take it down, it's still there. 
And that's the inside, not a very good picture of the air condition. We put, <clears throat> put the air conditioning and heating in that building. It just exactly what it was used for originally, we put, uh, put it right back in there. And all the building and the heating uh, and air conditioning will be done from there. That's another shot. That's a big uh, water tank. And that's what we saw when we first took a look at the building. Uh, very discouraging. You can see parts, pieces, and parts of the old rail that had to be replaced. And that's looking out towards uh, Spring 5. It's not a very good picture either, but it's just on the bridge, looking out on this mess. And that's the bridge with the rails off before uh, replacement. And we found a complete concrete uh, uh, walk all throughout that area. It's covered over now, so not too many of you will see it. Uh, and the reason why it's covered over is this. Uh, which is where the boat will float, if I suppose. If they, could, uh, but this stuff does. This uh, land, as you know, is karst topography, so it doesn't hold water too well. So who knows where they're going to put the boat if it ever floats? That's the way the uh, the spring house looked, Hygieia. That was the inside where there was an altar. We excavated at 18 feet down, and this is when the, the, the boys got about four feet down. And we found out why this spring probably was never used. And when we got down to the bottom, there was nothing but a huge freshwater spring. And it just kept bubbling up and filling this thing up. So the more we pumped, the more the thing filled up. But unfortunately, it was not spoodle water. It was runoff water from the spring, and that was a wet spring eventually in summertime in August, it did dry up. But it's doubtful that that spring, that particular spring house was ever used. So, after we did all that, and that just gives an example, we suspect that that is the, uh, the Sprudel Spring, and uh, that was in 1916, what is it? But anyway, that, that probably was in that beautiful building that's no longer there. And that's, that's what it looks like with a concrete floor after we covered it up, uh, the, uh, after we covered Hygieia up. There was nothing else we could do. And that's uh, excavation of the garden. And that's the tower. And that's the way it actually looks. That is not a model, that is a picture. That's actually the way that the, the roof looks today. And you can see we did a pretty good job of matching it. We tried to get rubberized uh, we, uh, for that roof. We tried to get rubberized material, but we couldn't match the uh, orange. I'm going to show this one last picture. This is, was on our Christmas card one year. But this building over here is the natatorium. And you can see, just in outline, what a beautiful building. Gail had a slide of that. And if there's anything I could leave you with tonight is, and this is my opinion, I do hope that you young folks that are students, the professors and HLFI, will consider working towards changing some of the wording to help us be able to build the natatorium without having to make it look so different that people could tell that it was a, not a restoration, but a new building. This is difficult for us to visualize that the wording in the preservation, in the preservation says that it should be different. Well, different to whom? Is it different to the ordinary man who could care less, or is it different to somebody like all of us in this room that are normally skilled in recognizing that something is attached to the building, that looks at it, looks like the building, but is, I think, a integral part of what it should be. I was saddened when I saw what they had done 
with the architecture of the library in San Diego. Here was this wonderful architect that gave them a beautiful building, and they hooked on one of the most monstrous buildings onto the side of that. I would hope that we all can work towards getting that particular part worked on in the law or in the policies or in the guidelines, whatever, uh, so that we can do these kinds of things without absolutely uh, uh, killing the, the beauty of the building. Ladies and gentlemen, Gail and I would like to thank you for your patience and uh, thanks so much for sitting on those hard chairs.